What's going on, everyone? Yeah. Even though I still film a bunch of videos, I'm a little rusty because it's been a few years since I've spoken on stage. But uh, what I want to cover today is the low carb athlete and a couple different variations of how that might look, kind of combining ketogenic diet with workouts with various forms of fitness, whether it be endurance work, whether it be more anaerobic work, talk about kind of this interesting elephant in the room of insulin sensitivity. Is it good? Is it bad if you're low carb? Do you want more peripheral insulin resistance? Uh, we're going to kind of go into that and what works best for, for the athletes. So I have no disclosures. <laughs> so here's what we will... Uh, kind of cover in a nutshell. I'm going to skip over the table of contents here and we'll just jump right into it because we only have 25 minutes. But essentially we're going to cover keto adaptation. We're going to talk about how long it takes to get fat adapted, which is a very important piece because I'll tell you from experience being on the opposite end of sort of the norm in the athletic community being a lower carb athlete, people think you absolutely have to have carbohydrates and if they try a low carb diet, if they try a ketogenic diet, they're usually not giving it enough time. That's the simple rule of thumb. They're just getting into this gray area where they feel weak for a couple of weeks and then they throw in the towel and they say, no wonder everyone talks smack on this stuff. It doesn't work. I feel like garbage. But if you give enough time and allow that adaptation to occur, which we'll talk about with some very landmark stuff that you've probably heard before, you've been in the community before. Uh, so we're going to start by looking at ultra marathon runners, ultra endurance athletes, uh, simply because we have the most concrete data with those cohorts first, and we're starting to see more anaerobic data come out. Now, I kind of did my slides a little bit different. Sometimes I like to just do a picture and like talk a whole lot, and sometimes I like to go deep and have a lot of detail. This way you can take pictures. I don't know if you guys are gonna get copies of the slides later on, but you guys have probably seen the, uh, the old Volick study that took a look at the ultra marathon runners. Uh, basically what they found with this is that low carb runners peak fat burning rate was 2.3 times higher than the rate for regular carb fed athletes, uh, which is not a huge surprise because when you're low carb, your body's oxidizing fats. Okay, that makes sense for an endurance athlete that's going through what's called beta oxidation and actually utilizing fats as a fuel substrate. This isn't a huge surprise, uh, but where things got very interesting, and again, this is an older study, but it's important to mention, the keto athletes broke down more glycogen than the total amount of carbs oxidized during the three hour run. And they essentially had the same amount of glycogen depletion and glycogen restoration or repletion after refeeding. So what this tells us is in extreme adapted athletes, and I, I say extreme because this is pretty extreme, they end up basically tanking glycogen using just as many carbohydrates for fuel as a carb fed athlete. So the old argument of, okay, well, you need carbohydrates to fuel, that's not invalid because you do when you're exercising. But when you're fat adapted, your body has the ability to leverage glucose from other substrates, uh, as clearly demonstrated with this. Uh, so while it's speculative, it's believed that glycogen is broken down in the keto adapted athlete in order to provide a constant source of oxaloacetate for optimal TCA functioning and aerobic respiration. So essentially, that's a very fancy way of saying the body is still breaking down glycogen in a very similar fashion. And glucose is also converted into pyruvate, which can then be converted into lactate or alanine via gluconeogenesis. And again, I think everyone's probably fairly savvy with gluconeogenesis, but the big kind of glaring piece that people get confused about is that we create glucose not just from protein breakdown. We do from deamination and ultimately alanine driving this gluconeogenesis process in the liver. But a big portion of it in an athlete ends up being the glycerol backbone of a fatty acid. So when you break down fats and you start oxidizing the fatty acids, you're left with that glycerol backbone, okay? And that glycerol backbone doesn't just disappear into thin air. That glycerol backbone actually creates more glucose for you. So people think, okay, well, protein is going to kick me out of keto. Protein is going to negatively impact me because it's going to increase my sugar and things. Yes and no. Uh, most of the time, it ends up being the glycerol that's the driving process behind this. So the more fat that you consume, the more faster digesting fats, MCT oil, things like that, those are going to leave you with more glycerol backbone to ultimately create more 
glucose, via gluconeogenesis. So in a fat-adapted athlete, they're so efficient at creating glucose from other substrates, it's almost as though fats become their carbs. And if your stomach can handle it while you are training, it's not a bad idea to have a little bit of MCT oil or something like that. Exogenous ketones have their place too, but not everyone handles those well digestively and in other ways too. Uh, and this is kind of what I opened with. Are people giving keto enough time? Because this is that big, big kind of, uh, Dr. Will Cole says it best, I, he calls it metabolic purgatory. It's like the, you're not fully keto adapted, so you're not getting the benefits of having ketones, but you're not giving yourself enough carbohydrates to be a carb-fed athlete, so you're like sitting in this really cruddy gray area where your body's just inefficient at both things. And when most people attempt to go car low carb, especially athletes, they're like, have a little bit of trepidation and they're not all going all the way. So they're like still dancing around having just enough carbs because they're afraid to completely let them go. And that's totally understandable. But then you end up left in that, in that gray area. So we're going to talk about indicating keto adaptation. Now there is a difference between fat adaptation and keto adaptation. Fat adaptation is where you've essentially developed the mitochondrial machinery to utilize fats better, you know, CPT1, some of these things that allow fats into the mitochondria. Uh, that's fat adaptation. Keto adaptation is just like the name implies where your body's actually utilizing ketones. You can be fat adapted and not be in ketosis. Like an endurance athlete that consumes a lot of carbohydrates very well is still probably fat adapted. Keto adapted is kind of one step further. So, over the course of days, when you're looking at how long it takes to become sort of an athlete with fat adaptation, serum ketones increase rapidly after initiation of a keto diet, reaching one to two millimoles, uh, two to four days, and remain within this range, excuse me, after a prolonged period. Fat oxidation rates reach a plateau after five days on keto. So you don't start saturating the cell with more fat if you've been on keto for a long period of time, you do have more cellular machinery that allows the cell to utilize more fat, but you're not marinating in fats, so to speak. You are allowing more keto adaptation to occur. Then over the course of weeks, uh, glucagon, which kind of helps you maintain that glucose availability and induce ketogenesis, is elevated for a week, and it kind of returns to baseline after three to six weeks. Given the estimates that mammalian mitochondria have half-lives in the one to two week range, and since it takes about five half-lives to reach equilibrium after a change, an increase in mitochondrial lifetime might take five to 10 weeks to reach a new steady state for enhanced mitochondrial density. So in essence, it takes one to two weeks to kind of have this half-life of, uh, of a mitochondria. So every time you're having this changeover in mitochondrial machinery, utilization of fats, you know, less utilization of glucose, so glucose tolerance decreasing, fat utilization increasing. It happens in some mitochondria, and then they reproduce, you know, they go through their whole process, right? So eventually, after about five to 10 weeks, you're back at homeostasis at a new state. You're back at equilibrium in a fat-adapted state. So generally, five to 10 weeks is when you start to see, like, optimal fat adaptation occurring. And then ketones continue to compete with uric acid for absorption, which doesn't really matter too much here, except for people that are, might be concerned about the uric acid levels. Uh, clinical investigation, uh, so this Finney study, which a lot of you have probably seen before, uh, resting muscle glycogen in obese subjects decreased to 57% of baseline after one week on a hypocaloric keto diet. Okay, however, after six weeks, glycogen recovered to 68% of baseline, and subjects showed 155% increase in treadmill time to exhaustion. So this just goes to show that probably the more lipids that you have circulating, the more adipose tissue, it might actually take less time to get fat adapted. And part of this is because uh, PPAR alpha, PPAR alpha, which is sort of the, it is a transcription factor. So what that means is it's a nuclear receptor protein that travels to the nucleus of a cell to ultimately reprogram for fat adaptation. That seems to, in the, at least the rodent model research, work better when it is lipids that have been liberated from adipose tissue compared to, say, saturating your body with dietary fats. Not to say that dietary fats are bad. What I'm saying is that an obese person that is liberating more fatty acids from their actual tissue might end up getting fat adapted faster than a lean person. So when you look in the case of athletes, if you're leaner, it just might take you longer. It might actually take you longer to get fat adapted. 
which is why so many athletes struggle because they need to give it more time. So what I usually suggest to athletes, people that are in a professional setting, I almost always, whether it's special operations, whether it's uh, law enforcement, whether it's professional athletes that I'm working with, usually in downtime when they're not deployed or when it's off season is when we indoctrinate them into keto because they are going to have to accept a short-term decline in performance more often than not, at least if they're heavily anaerobic with what they're doing. Uh, what is the opportune time? So essentially, this is what I just covered. Uh, you're really looking at three to six months for that optimal PPAR alpha kind of optimization to occur. Uh, this is what regulates everything. It is the master of like this entire symphony. So when everything changes over, you need this massive paradigm shift in your body. It's not like the cells just magically start using fats. You need everything to reprogram. Uh, and with that, it's a give and a take. You know, usually, usually you end up seeing uh, glucose tolerance going down and fat utilization going up. Let's talk about just the role of protein for a minute because this is obviously a really important piece. We used to think that protein obviously was not the best thing uh, to be jacking up as high as you can in a ketogenic state because if you look at a you know, therapeutic ketogenic state, yeah, obviously protein's gonna be pretty low. It does seem to change with the athlete. And this is going to be the same whether you're a low carb athlete or not. Uh, oxidation of amino acids to be used for hepatic gluconeogenesis and for deamination or as a fuel source by skeletal muscle mitochondria. Uh, I think the most important thing that we can take away from this, I'll let you take a picture of this slide and I'll kind of get to the gist of it, um, is gluconeogenesis is demand driven, not supply driven. So what that means is extra protein for a low carb athlete is not going to knock them out of ketosis. It's not going to ruin that. As a matter of fact, it actually might make that whole metabolic flexibility piece a little bit easier. You know, the more that you can drive up some glucose demand, the more that you can allow the body to use both fuels. Now, I talk about this railroad track analogy a lot. I've mentioned it in a number of videos. So if you have a, a freight train going down a railroad track and you have one track that forks off to the left and one track that, track that forks off to the right. Uh, you're gonna have that little lever that the person jumps off and kind of moves that lever to allow the train to go left or right. Let's pretend for a second that left is the glucose track and let's pretend that right is the fat oxidation track or the, let's just say fat utilization in general. So if the train has consistently been going down that left track, when someone jumps off to pull that lever, it's gonna be really hard to pull that lever. It's gonna be hard to pull that lever. They're gonna need a lot of WD-40. It's gonna be really rusty because they can't move it over to the fat adaptation side. Okay, so what we wanna aim for is how do we get the body so we can actually get over to that fat adaptation side seamlessly when we want to. But then we run into another problem. In the heavily fat adapted athlete, they start getting to a point where they become glucose tolerant or intolerant, and they're so used to going down the right train track that when you're asked them to go to the left, they still have that same problem. We have mitochondrial machinery for both sides of the equation. And that's where I'm a really big fan of, okay, how do we drive up gluconeogenesis a little bit more? How do we create a little bit more you know, natural glucose, if you will? Or how do we time carbohydrates properly so that we can allow the body to never really need that WD-40? So if the train says, hey, I'm in beta oxidation mode, I use a, like CrossFit as an example because it's really simple. You're going long periods of time where you're aerobic and then short periods of time where you're heavily anaerobic. My definition of fitness is being able to not go into serious oxygen debt when you go from aerobic to anaerobic. I think that transition is one of the most important and totally underrated aspects of fitness. Because when we look at fitness, we look at, I'm a strength athlete, I'm an endurance athlete, and that's it. Okay, or maybe I do a little bit of both, but it's that time period transitioning between the two that is the most important. And when I spoke at the CrossFit Games last year, you can imagine I was up against a lot of opposition, a lot of guys that really like to consume six, seven, 800 grams of carbs per day to do what they're doing. And I got up and I explained this. I said, why can't a carb-fueled athlete occasionally allow themselves to get keto-adapted or fat-adapted in an effort to elevate their baseline so that when they are in those lull periods of endurance work, they're able to maintain heart rate, they're able to get themselves back into the parasympathetic a little bit more, so that when they do transition to anaerobic, they've got maximal performance. Long-winded way of saying, 
don't worry about gluconeogenesis. So as far as recovery is concerned, this is just some hot little tips that people can use. One of the things that we've seen over the last couple of years that may not seem like a rocket science, but we're seeing more and more of it, is that the hydration aspect really dictates how well we utilize fuel substrates. Like if you're dehydrated, it doesn't work as well, plain and simple. Obviously, again, with a low carb diet, insulin levels are low, so therefore you're excreting more water, you're excreting more minerals, you are generally going to be dehydrated if you are an athlete and you need to make a concerted effort to be more hydrated than your carb-fueled peers. Uh, there's some interesting research that's been around for a while surrounding using straight glycerol. Like you can actually use, uh, you don't want to use a monosteric, you usually want to use like a, a Hydromax type glycerol as a supplement. Literally using glycerol can help draw water into the muscle cell much better than an electrolyte. So for longer endurance athletes, things like that, trying to find a way to leverage glycerol. Uh, and there's some tips there if you guys want to snap a picture, if you guys are trainers or anything like that, want to apply it for yourself. I've messed around with it. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. It's not hydrophilic because it, it, it doesn't require a bond. So essentially it just almost like a sponge will draw water into the intracellular space. So into the intramuscular volume. So you'll actually increase the amount of volume of water you can hold in your muscles. This is really, really good for a low carb athlete, not as important for a carb fueled athlete. And the interesting thing is, is a carb fueled athlete is going to have about the same amount of glycogen as a low carb athlete. So if you're savvy in the world of glycogen, you might think, okay, well, Carbohydrate stores are what are going to draw water into a muscle. If glycogen stores are the same, then does it really matter? Well, yes, because if you remember the slide from early on, we actually end up depleting just as fast, if not faster. So because of that, and because of the additional strain that is put on the kidneys as far as hydration, and basically urinating a lot, it becomes extra important. So electrolytes, a lot of salt, glycerol, if you're working out for longer than an hour or so. Another interesting piece, uh, taurine is becoming a really interesting one. I don't know if people have seen the recent stuff on taurine, but uh, taurine supplementation brings about improvements in VO2 max, time to exhaustion, uh, anaerobic performance, muscle damage, peak power, and recovery. There was a cool meta-analysis uh, found there is no difference between acute or chronic supplementation, and the dose of taurine, doesn't matter if you do one gram or six gram, and it's one of the cheapest supplements you could probably find, does not moderate its effect on endurance performance. Plasma concentrations of taurine increase 10 minutes after ingestion. Uh, but what is it actually doing? So taurine may reduce the contribution from glycolytic metabolism as it increases glycerol, so it increases glycerol availability, thereby altering the fuel utilization and metabolic efficiency of exercise. It literally makes exercise easier. Uh, on a genetic level, taurine may alter gene expression of various enzymes, including PGC1A. PGC1A is very, very important for the fat-adapted person or the low-carb athlete because that is what is driving mitochondrial density and uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. So creating more mitochondria, creating more mitochondrial density is driven largely by PGC1A. So if taurine can affect the gene expression there, it's like a powerhouse for a low-carb athlete. Uh, this is also a very interesting one. Taurine may prevent leakage of ROS that's formed in uh, reactive mitochondrial environments and may act as an antioxidant, thus improving the efficiency of ATP turnover. They've seen this in muscle biopsies where they take people that get there to their lactate threshold for X amount of time and then they do a muscle biopsy and they find that taurine levels are elevated. But taurine levels are not elevated when they haven't been pushed to an extreme. And what they've ultimately determined with this is that it seems as though Taurine is a natural antioxidant within the body, specifically when it comes down to training at that lactate threshold level. So we're, I'm not a big fan of like taking antioxidants in. I like the body to be able to do what it possibly can. But what's interesting about taurine is it seems to drive up endogenous antioxidant pathways. So for me, like I don't like to take echinacea or vitamin C or anything like that after a workout because you're kind of blunting the natural superoxide dismutase, glutathione, everything that's happening to trigger adaptation. I'm a big fan of waiting till later. But taurine seems to be a little bit of an exception. Uh, taurine and quercetin specifically drive up these endogenous processes. So that's something that you can get away with having post-workout and still be able to induce a more powerful endogenous effect. I don't need to spend a lot of time on creatine, but I will say again for the low-carb athlete, 
super important, not just from the ATP turnover, but also just from being able to store more water. So this is, Jeff, how am I on time? Okay, cool. So uh, the insulin sensitivity piece is quite interesting because we have two sort of opposing schools of thought in the low carb world. And I don't think that any one is particularly inaccurate. Uh, one side says insulin sensitivity would be bad if you are a low carb dieter because you want that level of peripheral insulin resistance because that's what's driving glucose to the brain. You want your cells to not be really good at using glucose. If you were a sedentary person, I could kind of understand how this works, how that, that argument comes into play. But I always tend to look at it from an athletic model where once again, like that train track, track analogy, I want the cell to be able to use both. So I want a certain degree of insulin sensitivity. In fact, I want a lot of insulin sensitivity because if I do get to a point where I bonk and I need to bring in some exogenous carbohydrates for whatever reason, I don't want to end up in gastric distress. I don't want to totally bonk harder. You look at endurance athletes and one of the reasons that they bonk is because they've shifted everything so fat adapted, but then they give themselves like these goo packs or something and they give themselves 200 grams of carbohydrates. And a lot of times their body will bonk even harder because that's a very short lived amount of fuel. And if their body's not good at using it, that's not the greatest. Uh, so let's just talk about some ways that you can increase insulin sensitivity. This is some really new stuff. It was like end of 2022, uh, sauna post-workout. Okay, now there's a million reasons I could tell you the sauna post-workout, but the insulin sensitivity side is pretty cool. Uh, so 80 subjects underwent steam sauna bath therapy at 122 degrees on seven occasions, uh, 15 minutes each, and at the end of the study, fasting blood glucose was significantly lower than the start of the intervention. So heat therapy activates the heat shock proteins, which triggers an adaptation which not only help to shunt glucose into the muscles, but can increase J and K activation, which blocks the inflammatory molecules that disrupt insulin sens uh, sensitivity in, in the signaling in the first place. So a lot of times after a workout, your inflammatory response is very high and you want it high for a little bit because that IL-6 is what's gonna trigger sort of the recovery. But in most metabolically unhealthy people, that stays elevated for too long. And by sort of increasing the J and K activation, you downregulate this in time, which lowers the inflammation, which allows insulin signaling to occur better. So another recent study found that sauna post-exercise increased cardiorespiratory fitness, lowered systolic blood pressure, and lowered total cholesterol levels significantly more than exercise alone. Uh, in terms of improved cardiorespiratory fitness, animal models show that exercise and heat leads to improved heart contractility. Uh, so again, just other reasons. I'll kind of glaze over this and talk about it for a second, but the ETRF approach. So if you are a low carb athlete or even not, one of the ways that I suggest people manipulate being able to maintain fat adaptation in the presence of potentially more carbohydrates is to utilize an ETRF approach. Uh, and the reason I suggest that is ETRF is early time restricted feeding where you are basically cutting off food at maybe 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m. You're skipping dinner. Albeit, I don't recommend doing it every day. I recommend doing it a few times for a week. It's difficult with a family. Uh, but with that, you're allowing to achieve this maximum amount of insulin sensitivity overnight. And if you train in the morning, it allows you to train in a very deeply fasted state and be very, very insulin sensitive. Because what's happening is not only are you insulin sensitive from the ETRF fasting and the lapse of food, but you're also very insulin sensitive from the workout itself. So it's this double whammy effect. So if you're trying to achieve maximum fat adaptation and maximum insulin sensitivity, it grants you a little bit of amnesty to have some carbohydrates post-workout without as much negative effect. So in other words, because you're aligning with the circadian cues of your, your cells, you're able to work out, have a few carbs, maybe you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, depending on how hard your workout is, and a very, very minimal effect because your insulin sensitivity is like super stacked at that point. Uh, kind of transition into the hormone piece for a little bit. So we have to talk about how insulin sensitivity impacts testosterone, and we'll talk about how testosterone really does impact muscle because it's not exactly what people think. It's not like this giant driver for building muscle, although it's important, of course. One of the functions of testosterone is to suppress the expression of estrogen receptor beta. So with less testosterone, more estrogen, as in the case with obesity, 
estrogen receptor beta becomes overactive, which leads to suppression of GLUT4 transporters in the molecule. So this is the correlation between testosterone or low testosterone and insulin resistance. There's a lot of different factors, but it ultimately ends up being these increases in estrogen receptor activity that ultimately are decreasing GLUT4 activation, making it so that glucose can't get sucked into the cell as well. And that leads into this vicious cycle. So glucose homeostasis is severely compromised uh, by GLUT4 suppression and results in insulin resistance. And this feedback mechanism can lock them in a cycle where increased fat tissue leads to less testosterone, more estrogen, less testosterone leads to suppression of GLUT4, which leads to more insulin resistance, and you get the gist. So insulin resistance compromises the nitric oxide production of the endothelial cells, which are lining the walls of our arteries. So then you're not able to, you know, yep. So then meta-analysis uh, covered 12 studies with 545 total participants, confirming that fasting is an effective way to decrease weight and improve insulin sensitivity. But fasting seems to be a viable way to address serious defects of male health, like infertility, erectile dysfunction, high estrogen levels, which can further worsen your metabolic health. So before people reach just to say, hey, I'm gonna go on testosterone replacement because I need to build my muscle back up, or I'm 50 years old, I'm 60 years old, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think that people need to take a really good hard look at their life and realize if they're ready for that commitment yet. Because a lot of times, and I can speak on multiple occasions with different people that I've talked to about this, if you get the metabolic functioning like system all together and copacetic, a lot of times these things seem to kind of balance back out. At least as far as like follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are concerned, you may not see this huge increase in serum testosterone, but you're seeing the brain communicate with the testes again, which is super important. What about testosterone for muscle growth? So they reported that circulating testosterone levels might not be the most important factor in the signaling power of testosterone. Uh, men underwent a 12-week endurance program and were divided into responders, those that gained muscle, and those that didn't gain muscle or gained little muscle. It was shown that the difference in muscle mass between the two groups was not driven by testosterone levels, but by significantly different density of androgen receptors to which testosterone binds to between these two groups. So non-responders had lower levels of these receptors, meaning that they were less sensitive to the anabolic signal of testosterone than those with higher density. So a lot of this has to do with our metabolic health, has to do with our mitochondrial health in a lot of ways, has to do with our glucose tolerance, has to do with our genetics, has to do with our lifestyle. It's sort of the quintessential sort of lifestyle, uh, you know, genetics load the gun lifestyle kind of pulls the trigger thing. So with this, it's like increasing your testosterone levels aren't going to magically make you build more muscle. They will through a lot of direct and indirect pathways. But the point in saying this is there are lots of people walking around with moderately low testosterone levels in the 300s and the 400s that can build a heck of a lot of muscle. And it has to do with not just their serum levels of testosterone, but their actual localized levels and the androgen receptor density, how much they can actually absorb. If you can absorb just fine with 300 milligrams, that's totally fine. But if some people need 1,000. Uh, and this is where I kind of want to wrap up with some interesting stuff, because this is where I've been going lately. And those that watch my content know that I, I've made a pretty big shift with this. You know, we're seeing so much evidence with Mediterranean keto and being able to implement monounsaturated fats moderate amounts of polyunsaturated, depending on where they're coming from. I, I still don't have a solid answer on where I stand on a lot of polyunsaturated fats. But monounsaturated fats are demonstrating to be very, very powerful. And Mediterranean keto diet focuses on polyunsaturated fatty rich foods like nuts, seeds, fish, seafood, and has a high monounsaturated fat content, primarily from extra virgin olive oil, while limiting red meat, processed meat, added sugars, and processed foods. I will add a caveat to that. Like my version of Mediterranean, and I've seen other bodies of research, I still have red meat probably four to five days per week. It's just usually leaner red meat, which is how it's always been for me anyway. I've never personally digested the super fatty cuts well. I think they taste delicious. I just don't do well with them. Uh, so the polys have a plethora of well-known benefits made weight loss by activating uncoupling protein one, which goes directly in line with what keto can do as well. Oleic acid is converted to OEA, which activates this PPAR alpha that we talked about. So there's indirect and direct ways that we can influence more brown fat activation, ways that we can influence more fat adaptation and improve insulin sensitivity. And then we have non-starchy polyphenol rich veggies, which are consumed in abundance on a Mediterranean protocol. That's kind of what I've been following for like the last five years anyway. 
so the journal Medicinal Food looked at the effects of a Spanish ketogenic Mediterranean diet on fatty liver and those with metabolic syndrome. And by week 12, all of the subjects were free of MS and 100% of them had normal triglycerides and HDLC levels, despite the fact that 100% of them still had a BMI of over 30 kilograms uh, per meter squared. So with this, that is very powerful because it's really difficult to see someone with a high BMI really shift their metabolic health that quick. It can happen with fat adaptation, it can certainly happen, but in this particular case, to see someone with a high BMI still develop these good plant, uh, lipid profiles, that's pretty awesome to see. And uh, that is that. Thank you guys.